some more light on in here. How's everybody doing tonight? Probably not very many on since it's Friday night, but I can try. Oh, let's see. That up and get another light on. Here we go. Hey, Jill, how's it going? Looking at this muscular skeletal section, it's a beast of a section. I got to get finished doing. Let's see, two, nine, eight, sixes. These are going to be over here somewhere. There they are, right? We've got 14, 15, and 16 right in a row. And they're pretty good. And we're on 214. And we're on column two is where they're at. So I just write two, one, four. This is a beast of a project too, if you haven't already done so in your CPT book, whether you have the 2002 or the 2001. Be sure and go through all your sections, find all the red codes, and just at least write down the page number where they're at so that when you get here and you find out that they're not here, you know where they're at. You don't have to go look through this range of codes to try to find them. Hey, always, how's it going? Birthday was good, although Travi did get suspended from school yet again. On my birthday, he went with full intentions of being very, very good. But um, good gracious, so he's been home all day with me, so of course I can't get nothing to done today, and he'll be home Monday too. I can hear him in there. Oh, poor Travis. I know. He w he was in class, and the school gives out these um, white binders to hold all their work and all their classes, and um, the school has them. They, they give them out as they get wore out and stuff. Travis had finished his bell work and was waiting for the class to begin. He decided that he needed a new binder at that particular moment. And asked the teacher, may I have a new binder? They're in the class on the shelf or something. I don't know. And um, she said no. Well, of course, Travis waits till she goes on about her day helping the other students and gets up and go helps himself to a binder. So they suspended him for two days for theft of something they were going to give him anyway. Um, it's just getting kind of ridiculous. But, um, you know, he was told no, but he does have, you know, an executive function disorder. He has a hard time knowing that no really means him. I'm, he assumed that no meant that she would not get it, but that he could go get it. <laughs> You know, of course she meant no, you're not going to go get it. But there was a teacher in the classroom and they had a teacher's aide in the classroom. And I think um, a simple, you know, no, Travis, sit down. We aren't doing a new binder right now. You need to do this, this, and this or whatever. A redirect would have been more appropriate, um, is just my opinion. But instead of suspending him for two days for theft since especially they had two teachers in there. But what do I know? I'm just some angry parent. So. Oh, hey. Who is that? Hey, Jane. How's it going? Hey, Jill. <laughs> yeah, this teacher's ready, so ready to retire. She has done her time. Also, 
the first day he was in class with his teacher, um, Travis had been homeschooled all of his life for um, since kindergarten. It was just too stressful for him. Um, and we went through the school district, and I did homeschool for him. And then COVID hit, and then now he's in regular class. So he does have some things to learn, of course. Um, but now he's in seventh grade. And his first day in that teacher's classroom, he brought a water bottle and one of the other kids in the classroom also had a water bottle. And him and that kid decided to uh, scoochie a little water at each other because they figured out how to poke the little holes in the top of the water bottles. And, you know, if you squeeze, you can squirt, squirt some out of it. So Travis and another kid were doing this while she was settling down the kids first day of school for the entire year. And they had all been separated for two years for COVID anyway. So she was very upset about that and was traumatized by Travis spilling water in her class. She went to every other teacher that Travis has that day and told everyone about Travis spilling water in her classroom and not to allow him to ever have water in their classrooms. <laughs> she, She's... She's never been happy with Travis and I, so my goodness, I'm I'm, I'm thinking. She, I mean, if a little spilt water upset her, good gracious, I knew it was going to be a big year. <laughs> and you know, Travis is highly, you know, susceptible to all the tricks of the trade. He's never been in class except for kindergarten to know all the do nots and do's, and he hasn't been there to learn all the lovely lessons about following the leader. Let's not do that. You're going to get yourself in trouble, but no excuse. I don't want him disrupting or destroying anything of the school property. At least he didn't get suspended that day, but I thought it was a bit aggressive going to all the other teachers and telling them that, oh, watch out for this child. He can never have a water in your classroom. <laughs> I... um Brownie, yes, I am. He has an, an IEP um, for many things, um, and he really should not have been suspended for any of these reasons, and I've taken it long enough. So I did hire a lawyer today, and they are going to be surprised Wednesday because we have an IEP met meeting on Wednesday and I'm bringing the lawyer that has already sued the school district for of my state or county whatever um, and won several cases already she's pretty famous and very aggressive too so I'm going to get all of them wiped for the entire year I'm done <laughs> you know I take it. I took. I took it. Last week was three days suspension. Just take it. Take it. Take it. I'm not. I'm not taking it anymore. I'm done. What the heck did you do? You put the flowers on you. Oh my gosh. My mom got me one of those pull open boxes for my birthday. When you open it, all the butterflies fall out, and these are the flowers that were inside. Travis's brothers just attached all my flowers to Travis's shirt. Don't you look pretty? <laughs> anyway, I don't like to be Mama Bear, and I like to leave things alone, and I like to to let things go. But I'm done. I'm done playing with the district, and I don't want next year to be this way. To get out, no red dye. Put it back. No. My birthday present, no Swedish fish well, for I, you. For my birthday, I'm asking you to buy you And food. red dye is bad for Mr. Travis. Okay, you can have you. chocolate. I love you. Bye. Bye. <sighs> but anyway, I'm, I've, you know, I'm, I'm done, and I don't want to, to do this, but it's just enough. It's just enough. Yeah, the, saying he was a thief. For taking something that they were going to give him anyway. It's just ridiculous. I'm done. Yep, 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 yep. And I take took all the other suspensions. 
with grace and back them up for anything that they know. I know they have a terrible job teaching kids. I know it's just a very, un- it's it's underpaid, undervalued, and um, they do an amazing job. I could, I've done their job because I homeschool Travis for every subject through junior high. It's, it's, it's a job and a half. Um, I, I have full empathy for them, but I, I, the district is just being ridiculous now. So, oh, I'm back. Okay. I have tons and tons and tons, tons of questions for you guys. It's going to be so much. Y'all are going to love all the new stuff. I just kept finding new, new questions that I was like, oh, I want to go over that. I want to go over that. And I got some diagnoses that I want to do too. So, um, Oh, 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 let me turn off TikTok. Of 80% water. Let's make me realize I'm not fat. I'm flooded. They okay. say your body is made up of 80% water. TikTok Let's is so addictive. Oh, my fat. gosh. I got my new phone today, too, so my touch screen will work once I get a hold of Verizon and tell them to turn it on. So I got the new one here, and then I got this one that the touch screen doesn't work very much, but I got a column from a different phone to turn the right one on so whenever I get time I'll get that done and then I'll be able to actually reply to people a little bit better than what I have been the last couple of weeks because that touch screen not working is very frustrating so it's hard to reply when you can't touch the screen of your smartphone what's hitting the walls guys Travis Yeah, and then because you gotta wipe goo off of them and then don't replace them. Okay. What, Sammy? It's not not dinner time yet. Let me get through with my live and then I'll feed you. All right, so what I was doing here was marking my do nots and then also um, doing the... um, the yellow highlights, if it has a parentheses inside these CPT codes, be sure and go through the book and un- highlight those. That is super important, guys. <laughs> hey, Annie. Thanks. Barb, Bob Marley was a prophet. You know, Travis was the very first kid in kindergarten to read. His reading scores are off the charts, but multi-step items are way below the charts. So he's he's a savant in many, many ways, but then um, he needs a little guidance with other ways, and that's fine. Governments are thieves, working class. <laughs> I know, it's awful. I feel bad, but I'm not... I'm kind of like, you know, I just, I'm done with it. That's all on that particular subject for sure. But if you have not done this with your CPT codes, it's super important. Be sure, please be sure. Anything that is in a parentheses like this, it says EG and then whatever word, that will be in the CPC exam question. If they pick that code as a potential answer. What they like to do is pick two that have the same startup, amputation, amputation. That's just right up their alley. They love to know the differences to see if you know the differences in those CPT codes when they start out with the same wording. And especially if they're the same wording in another section of the book, like the only difference is th- these are all distal end, and then another part of the book, they're doing the same procedure on the same tendon, but it's the proximal end. They really love those too. So anything in the parentheses, some CPT codes don't have them. That's fine. But anything that they give a proper name, those have been showing up on their questions a whole lot. So be sure and mark those. Super handy. Look at all these short arms and long arms. I know it's not focusing very well, but it'll change. Just waiting on everybody to show up. There probably won't be too many people because it is Friday night, but I will post this on YouTube afterwards. 
But anything that has a parentheses, that just seems a lot more efficient of highlighting and likelihood of things that might be on the exam um, or in exam questions is definitely showing up. Something along those lines is usually something that's in those parentheses. Let me know if you got any questions before we get started. But I do have some practice exam questions we're going to go over. I got some ICD-10, some more modifiers that we had. Um, definitely going to be challenge challenging y'all. Some new questions I haven't even worked up, which was really fun, like we did on Wednesday night. Running into new questions is always fun. We just have to remember our steps. Take it one code at a time when we're doing the process of elimination. Looking for coding irregularities. Don't look at the question except for what you need out of it to make a difference on the CPT codes. Like if it's with or without ultrasound, all you need to get, do is go look for guidance. That's all you need to do with these questions. A whole lot easier to do it that way than reading the entire question and then going to look up all the codes. No questions? Y'all are good? Y'all know what I'm doing and why? And no questions about the exam or anything? We're good to go. Uh, musculoskeletal will be the next section I do. I just have to finish taking some pictures and then we'll be ready to post radiology and we'll get muscular skeletal done and then we'll do lab path and medicine as our last ones. I heard we had some teachers in here last uh, Wednesday from other courses in so open invitation if there are any teachers watching if they want to go live with me and we do tandem any kind of information we can share to anybody out there I think is wonderful so if anybody wants to join in on the fun and share what they need they know too let's do it together doors always open I've done that last year. I taught two classes for an AAPC instructor for her students. That was fun. I went through the entire CPT book and showed them what codes I thought would be on the exam and how to attack the questions in each section, what guidelines you might need to know for each section. I've done that once, twice, once. I've done that once for you guys, I'm sure, because I know part two of the exam I did the other night is on YouTube, but I need to go professionally do y'all a section by section like that too would be fun. I was supposed to get a copy of the recording, but never did, but life gets really busy and I forgot to re-ask and I'm sure she forgot to send it. That's Okay. I saw that um, something about the appendix A just need or appendix L and just needing that one. Yeah, I'll get back to you. Sorry, it's been a busy day. I had to go to the school district and get copies of crap and all kinds of stuff. So I'll get to you. I'll get it sent. We're going to get you to pass for sure. I hope you are doing well. Your information you shared helps so many people it's so lovely all the information you shared on what was on your exam when you took it um it's so nice of you to share i know you're making differences in people's lives too it's super helpful oh my gosh all these opens and closes oh lord so what i do for these is I take the word closed 
and I circle the word closed with an orange color just because um, it kind of looks red and closed means stop, you know. And then if it's an open procedure, I circle it with a green. That way I don't have to look very far. It's lighted up for me just like a stop sign. And if I get my pen to write. I think it's a great way to notice quickly which procedures are open and which procedures are closed. But there is a buku of this mess to do <laughs> throughout muscular skeletal. So that'll take you a hot minute to do that. But it's worth it, I think, the way it lights it up to let you know which ones are open and which ones are closed. But yeah, I'm a little behind on messages today, but I'll get, I'll get to you as soon as I get done with this. Still haven't even gotten to the movies yet. My mom ordered Memphis barbecue in to Arizona and had it delivered yesterday. So when I got done with work, um, I went out there and she had the cake, of course, on the table and stuff and started war warming up barbecue. And then by the time we finished eating, um, the movie at the theater had already started and stuff. So I'll eventually get to the movies with the boys. At some point this weekend, I got tutoring in the morning going on, maybe after that. All right, let me quit playing around or I'll sit here for an hour and a half doing this, <laughs> marking up the book. There's always so much to do, but I got some really cool questions to do that I think y'all will like. And I wanted to show y'all some of the processes that I would use to answering some of these diagnosis ones too. And how I could save some time, most definitely, and make sure that I get the right answer too. Where's my little thingy so I can hide some of the question. So if you're gonna take your test in person, Okay, so take a couple of blank pieces of paper that you can fold like this and then fold them one more time into a square and then you can take two of them and do like what I do here just hide your question out of the way and then go straight to your answers and then if it got a lot of modifiers and a lot of things down that will confuse you just start it one letter at a time and that will help in figuring out the process of elimination sometimes you can't see it with all the stuff that's going on in the question but this helps because I can see that C is different than the rest right off the bat And, and and filled up full of a room full of other people it gets it's distracting anyway so anything to help you stay focused and help you um, with this process of elimination I think is a good idea you can recreate exactly what I've done if you're doing it in person you can write on your test booklet all you want you're welcome to do that And what I would do is eliminate C, and then I would eliminate A, because B and D both have the twos. Then the only difference is a one and a two here, but also the seventh character. So how I would do this question if I was doing it, knowing just a little bit about the seventh character, a lot of times A means initial and then uh, B or whatever means subsequent or some other visits are going on. If it's a fracture, you know, that it could mean where the fracture is located and really have nothing to do with initial or subsequent. But I know that much about the seventh character to know that I'm pretty sure A is going to be initial of some sort of fracture. And this might be subsequent of some sort of fracture. If I was down on time and just needed to guess, I would look at my question 
and see what's going on. And it looks like somebody, oh, our little turtle fell at the bus stop and was in the emergency room. So seeing those words, I would think that it was initial and I would pick D and move on to my next question. Now, if I have all the time in the world, my three minutes or two minutes per question, what I would do is go only to S01, find my differences in the A's and D's, which is going to be located at the SO1, not all the way down to the individual codes, because that will take too long. But just go find out my definitions for the D and the A, and then go find those words that match in with the question. It's a lot e easier to find the SO1 and those seventh character definitions there than it is to get all the way down to 0 0.210 and then the 0.22. It just saves you a little time. And that's how I would handle this question. What is the difference between the D and the A on this particular question? If anybody's got a ICD-10 book with them. Thank you for the follow. Is it subsequent and in initial? Is it really? I wasn't sure. Sometimes it's not. You can leave them right there, sweetheart. Can I pop the balloons out in the backyard and pick up the garbage? No, you can't pop my balloons in the backyard. No. No. Not yet. Not till I'm ready to get rid of them. Wonderful, Paige. I hope you have a good time. I hope it's helpful. All right. So, since y'all are saying that this is the difference between subsequent and initial, we will look down here at our question. We do note that she is in the emergency room right now, probably the first time she was being seen. I would definitely pick that D and move on to my next question. I wouldn't do anything different with that question, except for maybe get it in focus of the camera. A little better for you guys. <laughs> Here's another external cause one. What would y'all do for this one? For anybody that's been with me long enough to know what I'm looking for, I'm looking for similarities between codes, and usually just the first one, to see what I can get rid of and what I would keep. I'd get rid of this one because it's got a zero right there where the rest have the ones. Perfect. Yep. And then the next one that I would get rid of is D because it doesn't have a nine there where that one does. And I do this because AAPC usually has a pattern that they give you two throwaway answers and then two that are very close because there's a guideline. There's some reason why they have those two codes together because they want to know if you know how to utilize the book in order to find your answer. Are there any coding irregularities in the last two answers in A and C? That's the next step that I do. I look for coding irregularities. So we've kept A and C because the first diagnosis codes are the same. The second one is not. The third one is the same. The second one has an A in the middle of it. Is that normal? Is that something we would do? I know in pregnancy, in OB and delivery, we have an external cause that does have some letters in the middle of it, but in general, we don't see that, and that looks like a coding irregularity to me, so I would just get rid of A and pick C as my answer and move on to my next question. I wouldn't even read this question. That's exactly what I would do, and... and 
99% of the time, I am 100% correct. Every once in a while, it might be one of your outliers, but it's very highly unlikely. I would just pick the C and move on. E and M, a guideline question, one I don't think I've given out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paige. We got so much more help for you too, Paige. There is a uh, Discord, which is so fabulous. Um, it's a full explanation of every section and help between all the coders to help each other pass their courses and their certification exam. You should download the Discord app from your Play Store. And then set up, sign up for your own account. It's free. And then join our Discord group. It's 24-7 help. Plus you have screenshots of my notes and things that I help you with or others in the group help and share. Um, we do practice questions in there daily. Um, and it's all sectioned off by... Um, different categories. If you just want ICD help, you just go into that ICD 10 room. If you want to know what to expect on your exam day or how to get an ADA so you get an extra hour for the test or what kind of camera to use for your exam if you take it at home, it's all in there. There's tons of information. You should really join that. Discord, yes. It's the, it looks like Mickey Mouse Britches app, but I think it's supposed to be a game controller but it certainly looks like Mickey Mouse's britches to me that thing right there super super handy dandy in my link tree here on TikTok in my bio I have a um, little link you can click and uh, yeah you'll get told too when I'm live on on TikTok, um, everybody shares and lets you know, but the the cool thing is all those side rooms, all those side rooms that I have that have all the resources, even job resources and everything else after you get your certification. If you want to get uh, your COC or other certifications too later on, you can do that. Oh, I got some of the rooms blocked. I've only got, you can, you can, um, Hit the sidebar and only see the ones that um, you haven't responded to if somebody's messaged you in them. So, sorry, that was picked. But there's the ICD-10 room, the CRC room, just tons of rooms. Med terms, anatomy, all free. Super wonderful little group. It's great. But yes, Discord is wonderful. So this is one of their multiple choice wordy questions about E&M services. So E&M services are reported with code 99211. All must meet all of the following requirements except. And they don't tell you what the following requirements are, but they, <laughs> it's like funny. So E&M for the 99211 thinking about that particular one e &M. is it a service rendered under direct supervision do turtles have a new complaint that their physician has not addressed is that what goes on is the services furnished as part of an incidental or part of a physician's or professional services in the course of diagnosing a patient. And when billing these, um, they must indicate a treatment was provided. Which one of these must meet all the following requirements except... Anybody want to take a guess on what AAPC wants as an answer? 
Because sometimes what the answer should be versus what real in-life coding is, is a little different, but they're just wanting to know if you know how to work the books appropriately. So a 99211 needs direct supervision from a physician. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> this is an exception. An exception. You're not looking for something that is... Yes, it is a nurse visit. So we so we don't need any direct supervision, not not in the terms that what they're thinking, what you would think of. We're practicing, I guess, underneath a physician's license, yes, but it's not direct eyeball supervision. <laughs> we also do not need a treatment course and frequency involved in a patient's course to see um, and, and do a nurse visit. We don't need that. We do need an order. We also don't need a diagnosis or treatment of an illness or injury either. The only one it can be is that the patient has a new complaint that has their physician has not addressed yet. It's because of the word except. Services reported with code 99211 must meet all the following requirements. Except. Yeah, it's the answer they want. It's the way the sentence is writ written. Met all the following requirements. Must meet all the following requirements, except it does not need to have a new complaint that a physician has not addressed. Ugh, it's a terrible terrifying question let's try another one about nurses you've seen this one before mm-hmm very tricky very tricky I hate it I hope no one sees that question ever again but if you do and you have it on the exam you'll know which one to pick what is their favorite answer? Everybody shout out and chat, I guess. <laughs> their favorite answer of all time is either all of the above or none of the above. Anytime I see that in D, I'm like seriously considering that as the answer. Every once in a while, like 1%, it might not be that answer, but 99.9% .9 of the time it really is always none of the above. Or all of the above. So don't make it hard on yourself. I'm trying to second guess that one. One more. To build time under the new guidelines that they updated in 2021. Which of the following counts towards total time spent on the encounter level? For the service determination. So can a physician count the time going to go potty? No, he can't. Those kind of things. So we're looking for which of the following counts. So what, which one's true? That'll be easier. No exceptions on this one. 
Is it minor procedures, care coordination, x-ray interpretation, or physical exam? Which of the following counts towards total time spent on the encounter? You as a coder, can you count the time that the physician spent care coordinating? And do physicians really care coordinate? Usually their medical assistants do that. They get their referrals and that kind of stuff going. So it's not B. You can't count care coordination. C, time spent separately interpretation of x-rays. That also cannot be coded because you would give them a professional component modifier and add that to the actual CPT code for the test if they were going to get a professional component for that. So we can't count that for E&M. We're only thinking about E&M. <laughs> Is a minor procedure in E&M, are we evaluating with a history, an exam, and an MDM are we doing that when we are doing punch best, biopsies? You have the best mother in the world. She just came. <laughs> I just had to lock Travis out. He was like, turned around and watched me lock the door. And he's like, oh, man, no, she didn't. <laughs> so. E and M, it, it's key words. It's key words sometimes in these questions. That one word difference matters to everything. E and M includes history. It includes an exam and it includes your MDM. And we don't do that on like punch biopsies or, or something like that. We, we, we just deal with the problem and build a code to remove the skin tags and send them on their way. Yeah. Built, yeah. So the only time that matters for E&M is the time spent on the physical exam. Technically it's counseling too, right? You've seen patients spend 55 minutes because they were sobbing to the physician, you know, so there's, there's gray areas in here, but the out of the answers given to us, that we have to choose from in front of us for this question, D is the answer. Just be very careful when you're looking at these wordy ones to notice the specific of exactly what they're asking if you have time. If you don't, just, just do your best. Um, what counts? So keywords. Uh, time counts, E&M, procedures aren't going to do it, x-rays not going to do it, you know coordination of care is done by the medical assistants, the only real thing is physical exam time, think of it that way. I think I do have that modifier tonight with the, um, with the um, practice questions. Oh, you probably don't mean the modifier. You probably just mean a 99323 versus, hold on. Mm. Mm. 99323-993. Two, three. Is that what you said? Nine, nine, three, two, three. 
Mm-hmm. Can you explain and three four? Are those good numbers? I've got a nine nine three two four. So focus on certain words on the question and answers. That's where they will get you. They will. You've got to eliminate a lot of that question. You see where you just get rid of all the extra words? E&M counts time. You've got to break down their questions into something more reasonable for you to be able to focus on getting the right answers. Even the questions or the answers. I'm like minor procedure, coordination of care. X-ray, physical exam. You still got to pare that down. All right. Let me make sure. Yeah, please make sure. What What do you look at? The question is, a six-year-old female patient is seen on day three of her hospital. Okay, so she's going to be subsequent. She's going to be subsequent. Or she'll be discharged. One of the two. She's subsequent inpatient or discharge. So day three, if she's still being admitted, yeah, two, three, three, not the fours. Yeah, following day. Yeah. So nine, 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 two, three, one. Versus three, three. So there's three of them in there. If you had a patient on day three of her admit, doc comes by to see the patient. He has to do all three. He has to come by or she Whoever the doctor is has to do a history on the patient, even on the third day, has to review that history, has to do a physical exam on that patient, and has to do a medical decision making whether to keep that patient in the hospital or discharge them. We have to have all three components for this because our, no, we don't. We have to have two of three. Subsequent is just two of three. So that's super cool. Two of three. So that means we can throw away one of these. And probably we would end up throwing away the history because you said they were a young kid. They were a six-year-old. What kind of history could a six-year-old end up getting or having to have been in the hospital for three days? Usually they're either septic, got poisoned, something like that happened. Let's see what you've been writing. So you're on day three, was in the hospital for keep her for two more days and consider discharge. Awesome. Perfect. That's excellent. So she had an expanded problem focused history. So all you got to do is go to your 99231 Nine nine two three two and your nine nine two three two. Look at the very first bullet point in each of them, and match that up. Which one says expanded problem focused history? It's not three one because three one says problem focused. Three two is your winner there. It says expanded problem focused history. So we would write three two down beside that. I'm not really looking at a chart. All I'm doing is looking at the codes in the CPT book on page 25. And I'm making my own chart. And this is how I would do it in the CPC exam. If I had that question in front of me on the exam, I'm going to write down my H, I'm going to write down my E, and I'm going to write down my M. And I'm going to go write down the last two digits of every one of the codes as they match up with what's being said in the, in the question. If their exam was detailed, I'm just looking at the CPT codes and I'm going to go look for the second bullet point in each one of those CPT codes 
99231 has problem focused exam, not a winner. 99232 says it's an expanded problem focused exam, not a winner. 99233 says detailed exam. So there we go, we got a winner. So I would put 33 beside this one for my exam. And then I would look at my question one more time. We had a low MDM. So I'm going to skim through those CPT codes till I find the word low as my third bullet point, which is my MDM. On 33, we're at a high complexity. 32, we're at a moderate complexity. 31 is a low. So that's a winner. That matches. So that's a 31 for my MDM. Wonderful question. So with this set of codes, the 99231, the 99232, and the 9933 are subsequent. And the guideline that's written in each one of their CPT code descriptors, the last words say at least two of the three need to match. Since we only need two of the three to match, we can get rid of our MDM because it's lower, meaning it's a lower level biller. And we would bill the lowest off of the two that was remaining, which is our history and our exam. The lowest number in those two is the three, two. So my answer would be a nine, nine, two, three, two is what I would bill for this patient because they are a under subsequent, which is a two of three. And that's exactly how I would do that question. This is my training session. Um, I do this three nights a week, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, two hours each night. I bring up practice questions. Don't mind you bringing your own questions. We can do those live too right here. And I offer the Discord where you can post your questions and we will be in there. Somebody will be to help you and answer those questions there. You can review the ones we've already posted and it's all there, all free. Happy to help out whatever I can. I do have private one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions available on a limited basis as time allows. I do have a real job as a medical auditor, but I offer them on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays usually three days a week. Um, I'll do every Saturday, but then one Saturday a month, I like to just go I hang out with my kids. But um, you can schedule that at the medicalcodingbygen.com website if you want to, and we can tutor. I have some people that tutor once right before their exam just to see if they're ready. Some that have not passed will send me their breakdown of scores, and then I build them a test of questions that I think are suitable or that they need based off their um, failed scores and present guidelines and stuff just like I do here in my lives. We'll do it one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom and practice questions. Um, I have workshops that I do on Zoom with everybody too. Um, Usually a couple of Sundays a month. My next one is coming up, not this Sunday, but next Sunday. Um, and those are like three hours long. And we do usually one subject. I've done two E&Ms, one cardiology and one integumentary, where we just do one question after another. I make sure my kids don't break in too much and um, I don't tell any stories. But um, we go from question to question really fast and explain all the guidelines in that whole section and show you every question you might run into during your exam in that section. But um, that's what I do. Yeah, I'm working on it. Hey, Maria. You're on Discord right now. Um, there's a link in... Um, if you go to, um, let's see, go 
go to my website, Medical Coding by Jen. Go right there to that website. Go to the drop-down menu where it says Social Media Links. Go right there. When that pops up, there is a whoop, Facebook and all that stuff. Yeah, 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 YouTube. Right there, the free study group link. Just click right there to join, and it'll pop you right in to the Discord um, study group. That'll link to your Discord account and pop you right on in there. Super easy to find. Just go to the medicalcodingbygen.com. Tons of resources on that website, too, that are free. To book tutoring, one-on-one, -on -one it's there. And then once I get my workshop posted that we're going to be doing on, or I'm going to be doing on the 24th, um, you can book that too. Those are 10 bucks, and then the one-on-one -on -one tutoring is 49 You're very welcome, JP. Um, these lives on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, since the time has changed, I am trying to get on 4.30 every afternoon, uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but um, it's real difficult because that's exactly the time that my kids come home from school. And I stopped working from the day. It was better when we were uh, on the other time zones with everybody else in the United States. I would start at 6.30 my time zone. And then that way, Florida wasn't but just two hours ahead of me. And that made it a lot less stressful for them to have to stay up so late. So I'm trying to adjust my times to meet their needs in Florida and stuff on the East Coast, but um, I still don't have a set time. It's just difficult at that time of the day for me, but I do my best to get on. Today was 5 o'clock. <laughs> Arizona doesn't have a time zone. We don't go forward and we don't go back, and I'm trying to meet everybody's needs to get on in a decent hour before y'all go to bed, so it's rough because right now everybody's three hours ahead of me, and, that's, and it's already 8 o'clock at night. By the time I go on, if I go on at five, but I'm trying. Oh yeah, my code for Discord is six two four three. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know why it took so long to find me either, JP. I'm sorry. I guess I'm not advertising or whatever enough. I don't know. I started this on TikTok a year ago. Actually, I've been doing it a year. I made a TikTok how I wasn't happy with the courses that people were taking versus the certification exam. None of the courses seem to prepare you for that certification exam. And they could if they were written differently. So I am sort of snowballed into this, but I love, love helping. And I hated seeing people suffer and not be able to pass this exam, and there is a better way to show people. Um, Ken, thank you for sharing the live. The one-on-one -on -one tutoring um, usually lasts about an hour and a half, to two hours it's supposed to be just one hour but I never I never do get done in an hour it just depends on the person what time they can hang out and what time I have but you're guaranteed an hour and then we go until we're exhausted or I have another client to do so yes JP we're working on it. Yeah, that time change is awful. It's it's horrible. <laughs> but I do get these. I do record these and repost them on YouTube. But it's just fun to do questions and have interactions too. Plus you learn better by participating. For sure, Annie. Already an hour. Y'all, I have so many questions. Hey, Mickey, how's it going? 
No schooling is needed for this. I prefer you not school. You can be self-taught. Absolutely. All that info is on my Discord or on my website, medicalcodingbygen.com. You can go there, look at what you need to get started. You just need a CPT book. I recommend to get the 2022 one. You can get last year's versions of the diagnosis code and hit picks at a later date, but start with that. And then uh, we can get going. I've got so many questions, y'all. Let me see. what. Where am I at? So this is, yeah, I have 20 more questions for tonight in one hour. It's not going to make it. <laughs> I'm not going to make it. Let's get started. Let's go, 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 go. So if I was seeing this question, I would know it's going to be a difference between an E&M visit and a procedure or combining them. What would I do? So looking at this, I, I know there's some coding irregularities. Do you guys see any? Do you see something you would not code together or would code together that might be missing something or has too much of? That's what I mean by coding irregularities. Very good, Betty. C needs a modifier. We would never code an office visit with a procedure without a modifier. So that helps our chances. Now we have a 75% chance or whatever. I don't know. Whatever that drops the percentage by. So it's not one out of four chances. It's, I don't know, one out of three. I don't know, whatever that is. But we got a better chance of picking out the right answer. Now all we need to know is, did we do just an office visit? Did we just do a procedure or did we do both? So I would look towards the bottom and see that we did have a trigger finger injection. We do have an MDM with a separate identifiable injection. So the exam is something you cannot prepare for um, an, enough, really. Um, the exam is built by psychologists who know the human nature and they write them to see if they can confuse you and make you pick the wrong answer. So what I am doing here, my whole purpose is to take the human nature out of your questions and answers. You know how you're in elementary school, you're taught to read the question and then look at the answers. Well, what I do is I teach this process where we're going straight to the answers. We're not looking at the question at all. If we do look at the question, it is only to gather the only the information that we need. We are never figuring out who the patient is, why they're there. We're not reading the question at all. I avoid these questions like the plague. Because if you read the questions, they're full of propaganda that will confuse you and make you pick the wrong diagnosis code or CPT code. Coding is difficult as it is without being shoved a bunch of propaganda um, to try to confuse you. So you can pass the CPC exam without knowing anything about medical coding from the way that I teach it. If you attack the exam from the the code's point of view instead of the question's point of view. So well, that's what I'm doing here. It's teaching you how to pass when you don't know how to code. All right. What is going on here, guys? If you were looking at this, see, this question, what is the first diagnosis codes telling you? We've got symptoms, right? We have COVID and we have sepsis. Our A41, y'all remember I wrote up that cheat sheet about sepsis? I know I remember it because it was very difficult to come up with, but I have everything you need to know about 
coating sepsis on one piece of paper with four examples. You just go to your A41, you write those four examples there, then you have every answer you would ever need for a CPC exam about sepsis right there. That, I love the A41. It just clues me into that. I know the R's for sepsis and I know U is our COVID, right? Um, People have been asking me for the COVID questions. The rest of the stuff I'm not going to look at. Just knowing that information about those is super helpful. I'm going to go to the bottom of my question. I'm not going to look at the top. I'm going to make sure what they want me to code. And then usually the last sentence will tell me why and what their diagnosis was. So they were admitted to the hospital for septic shock due to COVID, pneumonia, with acute respiratory failure. That's all I need to know. The rest of all this that happened to our poor turtle is all propaganda. Don't read it. What would be coded first? Everybody's saying C. Everybody's saying C. (laughs) Yeah, we would definitely code our septic patient first due to COVID and then the pneumonia and the rest of their diagnoses. But all we needed to know was what would be our very first diagnosis code. And not even knowing or looking in the diagnosis code book, if you've worked in this area long enough just to do some practice questions, you'll know at least that from me because I've given you the COVID. We've talked about symptoms being first diagnosis and pretty much everybody knows the brand new codes for COVID right off their head, just knowing that they're you because they're freaking hard to find in the diagnosis code book. Have you tried to find you in the diagnosis code book? Anybody raise your hands to say that I've never been able to find them until somebody pointed out that it was after the Z's because it's not in alphabetical order especially if you're in the 2021 book, (laughs) it was impossible to find. I'm like, it took me, I don't know how long to find those things because they didn't put them in alphabetical order. Anyway. All right. What's going on with these codes? We've got another septic code, right? The A41. And then we have all these eight, five codes. We have two of them that are the exact same. 820, 820. I like those two, the C and the A. If we're not septic, that looks great, right? (laughs) It's way in the back. I know, but it's behind. It's not even in A, B, C, D order. Everything else is in A, B, C, D order. Why the heck put you way back there not in A, B, C, D order? (laughs) Be consistent. The auditor freaks out when nothing's consistent. Okay. Let's go back down to the bottom. See what our final diagnosis of the day is. Our final diagnosis discharge is SARS. Acute alcoholic pancreatitis with alcohol abuse. So how many diagnoses do we have? We're not starting out with septic. We can definitely get rid of that. Yep, B has an irregularity in it. D has an irregularity in it. But what's in our throwaways, too? You can see what is in our throwaways, that that second code. Kind of interesting. Yep, A is our answer. So I like the fact that sometimes we can find 
a similarity in our throwaway that points us to the right answer. We knew we had B thrown away. So then it was a difference between A and C. But if we threw away D, D has the same answer as a, and that clued us in, and A is our answer. I love seeing that when it matches up. Very interesting. I'm sure it would be very difficult to see something like this during the CPC exam under stress. So I'm not sure how many people see stuff like that during their exam. A few have. Auntie CC and Wendy and Betty saw things like that on their exam. Um... It's, it's just one of those things you really need to practice a lot of to see when you're in a stressful environment and trying to see it. But it's there. All right. Mm, good Lord, another one of their stupid questions. Based on new evaluation and management, so keep thinking about E&M. What do we need for E&M? We need time. We need history, we need exam, and MDM. Every encounter. Which of the following in their documentation for every encounter? Based on the new changes to determine the level of service, best practice for providers to include which of the following in their documentation for every single encounter. What should they start including? <laughs> they don't even do that. You know that medical assistant's bringing up that patient name and creating that EHR documentation in their chart. Nobody putting a patient name in except for the front desk staff. And they have to go off what's on the insurance card. And then the patient gets upset if you call them whatever is on their insurance card because their name is is Roberto, but they want to be called Rob. They're just getting mad about <laughs> what you call them. Or if you have the front desk receptionist who will put in what's your name, and he says Rob, and then you send it to the insurance company and it gets denied because it doesn't say Roberto. Oh my gosh. And then you can't get any of their lab results to match up and go into their EHR because the lab tech said they were Robert, not Roberto and not Rob. Then it doesn't match. Then you have to manually go find their lab results, scan them into the chart and put them in as a PDF, which is awful because it's not under the lab tab. Like if it was linked under the lab tab, you would see their results keyed in from the lab as a lab result should be, not as a scanned PDF. It's a nightmare. I don't, I, I don't envy y'all. What is the answer? The answer is always AAPC's favorite answer. All of the above, none of the above, or both A and B. You know they like those combo answers. The answer is D. <laughs> a coder's job is to query a physician or a turtle when which of the following is true query means you have to stop your coding you don't bill a patient and you need to ask the physician more information about what's going on with this particular patient or customer they call them which i i cringe over but um which one is true We've got a does not, conflicting, not captured, or their favorite answer, 
all of the above or none of the above. Mm hmm. Phone a friend, whatever. They love that answer down there at the bottom. But don't take it for granted. You know, when I, I do these questions, they come from AAPC. Um, some of these are their practice exams, their CEU exams and things that they give out to us monthly. Don't forget to pay attention. We know right away our answer is going to be all of the above, but read and document in your CPT book some of these things because they might rewrite this question and take out all of the above and put something else in there. I don't know what, but if you had to read this question, you know the answer is do not. You know the answer cannot be or the answer is a do not and it is conflicting and it is not captured. They might change the an the question to say which one is not true. Not true. And then they'll put a different answer down here. And then you got to look for the one that is not true. So it's it's important just because you know what the answer is not to just negate what's here. Go on and pay attention to it. Write a little cheat sheet down um, of things that is true. And then a little side note of what isn't true. If you happen to see a question later on that says something about things that aren't true. So it's, it's important. I know we can go fast here, but don't forget to go back and you'd be surprised what you forget and what you think you might know and off your head until you get down to that exam and it's really nice that you have the time before your exam. Go on and write little cheat sheet notes. Anything like this I would write in the front of the book in any available white space before I got to the E&M section. I would just put um, query MD when um, data does not support. And then I would put conflicting opinions. Um Diagnostic data not captured. Just have a running list there and change colors between each item you bullet point so that you can tell there's different there. Because if you just write it all in blue ink or all black ink, you can't spot out the differences as fast as you could in colored ink. So just some ideas while I'm rattling off and wasting time. How much time do we got, Twinkle? I got... 14 questions to go. I did not get very far. Okay. For my risk adjustment people, I like to do at least one or two questions on Fridays about risk adjustment. If you are thinking about getting into CPC, also consider risk adjustment after you take your CPC or before. Risk adjustment is only one book. <laughs> no, you're fine, JP. I'm always rattling off. It's my fault. Um, I loved your question. In fact, I wish more people would bring me questions on the fly like that. That was lovely and very fun. I love it. Do it more often. Um, risk adjustment days on Fridays because I know there's a school of people that I help teach with their teacher um, of a bunch of CPC people that now their company wants them to become risk adjusters too. So they're watching me and I told them on Fridays I would do risk adjustment questions. This is just one for today. Um, but if you get your CPC, think about it because the risk adjustment certification is only one book. You only need your diagnosis book. Each diagnosis code, if you get the APC version of the CPT or the ICD-10 book, each diagnosis is already highlighted with the differences written in green between the codes, so you know what the difference is between those CPT codes, unlike the or the ICD-10 codes, unlike the CPT code book where we have to go make our adjustments and highlight what's different. The ICD-10 book is already done that way, and a lot of medical doctors' offices really want coders who are risk adjusters too. It's just the new way that America's going with their populations, and it would be an easier exam overall, I believe, because of the one book issue versus all three. So which 
one of these legislations led to risk adjustments. Anybody want to take a gander? Hey, Marie. Most everything really did happen in that balanced budget act. It is B. Oh, we got a none of the above. Oh my. What do y'all think the answer is? All right, we got an RO5, an RO6, and an RO11. If I ended up looking up these CPT codes, remember, or the ICD-10 codes, remember, don't go to the individual tiny little codes. Just go to the headers here. But what do we suspect the answer is? 40 more minutes. Oh, good. We're going to we're gonna be good. We're gonna be good. We're gonna be good. So we got a four-month-old turtle who is a patient who has acute bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis. Do any of those headers right there, R05, R06, or R11, have anything to do with that diagnosis? And think about it too. Normally, R's are what? There's symptoms like cough, runny nose, sore throat, those kinds of things. Yep. So a real diagnosis might not be there. And this is their favorite answer. Favorite answer. Thank you so much, Twinkle. All right. So what do we know is going on with this one? This one is an established patient, right? This one is a new patient. Those basics should be known about your CPT codes from 99202 to 99215. Just, I don't like y'all memorizing much, but at least those codes. Know that these are established, these are new patients. This, I have no idea what that is, but that's interesting, and that's cool, right? And since they are closer together than our 04 versus our 215, I suspect that these two are going to be it, and I would run to those two and see what our differences are. What are our differences between the 908 three, four, and the three, seven. Sorry, I'm slow. Psychotherapy. Yeah. 45. Or 60 minutes, somewhere around there. <sighs> what happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? What mean said? What did mean seen? It means, oh, you ain't got no book with you, Betty. <laughs> so Marvin D. Turtle, LPC, documented some counseling. How much time is that? Can you subtract time? Might be one of those things you have to do, especially in anesthesia or in this medical section, is to be able to subtract some time. So we've got 40 minutes, right? Where would you put that? Oh, she's quick. Y'all, she can pick out the right answer by looking at the CPT codes like I do, but knowing what's in the question. She knows which code is psychotherapy for 40 minutes and which one is our, is 60 minutes in her head already. She's, I bet she's got 10,000 codes in her head memorized already. Amazing memory right there. <laughs> Answer is B. Hey, moonbeams. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. 
Don't forget as a trick to look at the very top, top of your CPT book pages where they have a range like 81191 through codes 81311. Looking at those tops is a lot faster than looking up and down your columns through the CPT codes looking for the correct code. It's a lot faster. <laughs> mean, don't need no finger. She's got that entire book squirreled in that head of hers. It's amazing. This is a new Appendix L. Thinking about that, um, I owe somebody an Appendix L question they emailed me about. I do have that in my memory bank, so I have to go back to that and answer that question for them. But for right now, I found a different question for Appendix L. So I was excited to find this one today. So it's asking us about different <clears throat> arteries, veins, that kind of thing. Look at her. She doesn't even have her book right now. I told you she's got those things memorized. Um, I have a document on my Etsy store that has the current anatomy listed down off of people that have told me what was on their exam. So that's handy. Also, we go through the CPT book at the beginning of each section. There is a body part, usually a big picture of it, like the big heart in cardiology or the ovaries for the female reproductive system. We go through there and we write down every part's function, what it does to the body. And then we write the prefixes and suffixes there for all the anatomy that's related to that section right there. And that's generally all we need. There's only about five to six questions in anatomy on the CPC exam. And um, we usually get reported back what was on it. Phalanges, sesamoid gland, warthin glands, lots of glands. They love glands. Um, what types of bones, flat bones versus long bones, those kinds of things. Hey, lady from Facebook. How are you doing, Miss Balloon? <laughs> So anybody want to take a guess on this question right here? Are we in the great sap or a pop or a basalmic or I like to call it that because of the salad dressing. But uh, where would we find the answer to this question? And I do have some anatomy questions coming up soon. And this one right here is an anatomy question of our dreaded Appendix L. We got lower extremities. <clears throat> well, since this says an entire appendix, I would get rid of that. Which veins are in, which ones are in the extremities of the veins is easy to find. Right, we've got those noted in our Appendix L. You can go straight to the, the lower limb extremities, right, and look for any of those. I don't think the great thing is there, right? We got a different opinions about B and C. Let's see. It is C is our answer. There's your rationale for that one. Look at that. Examination of a calf vein may also be included. And look, it includes, look at all those femoral, 
We knew that. Proximal. The great sap is included. The popliteal is included. Good gracious. Their question was... Complete the bilateral upper extremity should include the examination of which veins? And they're picking the B one in the Doppler. We should have went to the code. That would have held the answer. But my goodness. <laughs> Great sap, popliteal, and our salad dressing balsamic. It was, it was our balsamic modifiers. Got some unusual modifiers today too. Some that I haven't done them. No worries, Moon. It's fun listening, and the repetitiveness of it will only help. Because you can watch this again on the live on YouTube. And then you can also make notes. You can pause the video and make notes. Um, add things into your book when you have time. <clears throat> so our 25 modifier is our e &M, significant, distinct, different procedure. 32 is mandated procedure, right? What is our 33 about? So glad I f you found me too, Moon. Happy to help. And you too, Facebook lady. Marlo. Pretty name. That is preventative. Very good. And our 59 is our generic... Let's add on a code. It's actually the most misused modifier in the real world and will more than likely get you more denials than anything else in the real world of coding. That is supposed to be the last resort modifier if none of the other modifiers, and there's like a hundred of them, and they're all in the Hit Picks book, if Another mod modifier will not explain what's going on and why you need another code in the same subsection. Um, you're supposed to use 59. But AAPC loves 59 and uses it way more often than you really would in the real world situation. But just to let you know, we don't use it that often in the real world as often as they use it here. Anyway, we've got... A squirrel who's coming in for an AWV. If you don't know your abbreviations, another thing that should be added to your CPT book. We're doing an end-of-life treatment for this patient. So what modifier would go with an ACP? Again, if you don't know what these modifiers mean or these abbreviations or modifiers mean, you need to stop, look them up. Google is your friend. And get your answers down so that you know them during your exam because you can't Google when you're there. So if you're doing end of life and you're helping the patient make decisions and document their wishes, as a healthcare provider, what modifier do you append to that note? <laughs> it is your preventative one, the 33. And if you don't run to your book and go write end of life right here, for your exam next to that modifier that's what it's there for here is your answers JP to everything you were asking what an AWV and an APC 
All those things are, we've got our annual wellness business visit. We also have our advanced care planning. Why we would be appending our 33. So be sure and get those abbreviations written. The back cover of your CPT book already has all your abbreviations there. If they're not there, write them in. And then the front cover of your CPT book has a cheat sheet list of all of your modifiers. If you don't have GA there for ABN, if you don't have QW there for your CLIA waiver, and then you haven't written in end of life for your modifier 33, it would be good. Who's taking their exam tomorrow? Who, who, who? Stacy, oh, good luck. Good luck, girl. I hope you see something tonight that is on the exam and you'll be like, I saw that yesterday. All right. Just please, please do the process of elimination. Don't look at the questions first. Go straight to the answers. Look for coding irregularities. Get rid of those. Only look up the codes first that are left over. Look and see what inside those codes are different. Then only skim the question for that difference. Pick your answer and move on to the next question. Please don't read the, every question from beginning to end. You won't get done in time and your brain is going to be fatigued and you won't get through but maybe 50 questions. The rest of it, your brain's going to be mush. Mush. Okay. Which body system is not included in a physical therapy evaluation? More anatomy stuff. JP, you were asking for. Physical therapy. Y'all have never heard of a physical therapist who comes by who does pulmonary? We know physical therapy does muscular skeletal. Right? We're looking for does not. So we know our muscles are part of physical therapy. <laughs> our heart is a muscle. Our lungs, too. Lymphatic is not included. In physical therapy which I don't really think is truly good or truly a good thing I was in physical therapy most of y'all know I fell with my phone in my hand you know I have one of these foldy phones and I fell like this with these two fingers hit right there on my phone and I went to physical therapy and my problem with those two fingers right there still to this day is my lymphatic system keeping the lymphatic tissue right here swollen and I still can't I still can't do that I can't do this with those two fingers it's just the lymphatic system keeping them swollen and uh, so that's that's like a question like I would argue with because muscular skeletal has everything to do with the lymphatic system. But in the whole scheme of things, I know they mean something different. <laughs> hey, MK, how's it going? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, a lot of these questions are what does AAPC want as an answer, not what is technically 100%. And they now have a legal... Thing you agree to before you take their practice exam questions that says, you know, legally we know this is crap, but out of the best answers, pick the best answer. <laughs> no. Nope. In, like the Lord of the Rings, when the wizard arrives late, he says he's never late because he arrives ex exactly when he's supposed to. Same thing for MK. It's perfect timing. Perfect timing. Wednesday's live is up too. If y'all want to see it, it's on YouTube. And then we'll have this one posted soon too. All right. 
So we can't do the process of elimination on these suckers, right? We've got our 6-5, our 6-6, our 6-7, and 6-8. They're going to be all in a row. What I do know is usually the 6-5 is the smaller of the procedure. Usually, sometimes it could even be the diagnostic first thing, whatever it is. And then they'll like biopsy or foreign body or or end up doing catheters. So it's whatever it is. I have no idea. But it gets progressively bigger, the procedure, and more aggressive as it goes on and gets higher in numbers. So that's one thing you can know in your head from the book that's a general, not always 100% the rule. Sometimes they throw little codes at you that are different, but in general, that's correct. And all of these codes are out of sequence. They won't be able to be found on the page where they should be because they are going to be in the C physical therapy evaluation section or C occupational therapy evaluation section. And they don't tell you where that page is at. And you have to go find it in this 10,000 page book crap during the middle of the exam, which will be traumatic when you have 60 seconds left for this question and you have no idea where to look for these codes. So if you have not written down the page numbers down where these codes are hidden, um, you're going to be hurting during your exam. So please be sure and go do that. (laughs) Somebody has went and found some of those codes for you, which is lovely on page 832. We do see our differences. They have components just like our ENMs. They might not have history, exam, and MDM, but they do have components and they must meet each component. And that meet or exceed. So pay attention when a CPT code has bullet points like these do. They have to meet each one of those criteria before you pick it. But my best guess is usually that it's never the first one. It's never the biggest one. It's usually a difference between the two in the middle. And if I was a betting person, I know AAPC likes you to code low versus coding high. So I would pick B and move on if I was just to guess and gamble at this exam. But in general, you can get rid of the first one. You can get rid of the last one. It's usually going to be the ones in the middle. They are always trying to trick you to code higher, but they really want you to code lower. (laughs) If that makes any sense, I would pick B. What do you guys think the answer is? Let's see. So they got an extensive review. Moderate analysis and a detailed assessment. And... Minimal to moderate modifications. Thank you, Twinkle. Y'all are correct. Follow along with me. You won't be wrong. So even not knowing nothing about where they are and what's going on, if they're all in a row like this, You'll see patterns like this as you're practicing these questions where, in general, you know it's not the first one, not the last one. It's between the two in the middle, and then go low. I finally found this question, and one more like it. (laughs) She does so good. And she has to really yell at me, too. She gets that clock going sometimes because I don't notice. I'm like, you know, a busy hummingbird, and you got to really throw rocks at me to get me to notice. (laughs) 
And by the way, in case you didn't know, every time you get a urinalysis done, they will do a GFR on your kidneys. And by the way, they are pre-programmed with a five foot seven, 120 pound human being when results come back. If your provider is not manually putting in your weight with your height and figuring up a GFR on their own, based off your result, your results are not what is in your chart, by the way, because none of it is is um, put in with your correct weight and height. GFRs have to be manually redone by your physician. <laughs> you know, back when they invented this test, when my Papa Norman was a young man, that was so him, five foot eight, 128 pounds, somewhere around there. You know, that was that's getting really close. Papa Norman, you know, was like that. That's when they when they built those, but they actually have to do it off of a height and a weight and they get your GFR results. But because the lab results don't have access to you, any of your lab work or, or any of your charts, there is a generic formula they put in for everybody in every GFR in every chart in every part of this country. If you're looking at that result as it is reported by, um, the health, the, the lab, it's, it's wrong. <laughs> Prior to working at McDonald's and Burger King, man, that work four hours and get you a medium fries and an apple pie was my thing. I loved getting the fries and an apple pie and I'd sit back there in their closet, I guess is what you call it because it ain't no break room. It's a closet and eat those fries and um, the apple pie. Yes, I did work at McDonald's when I was 15 just to get out of school, because they let you out of school four hours early, and you'd only have to stay there three hours a day if you went to work. So I got a job at McDonald's. And then I quickly realized, mm, not quickly, but long enough, but I went that summer to lifeguard school and decided that I didn't want to work that window anymore because I would audit every bag to make sure everybody had all their crap. And I did a really good job, but man, I was always worried about everybody's not getting their stuff. And, and, um, that was a lot of, um, multitasking right there. Lifeguard, wonderful position. You sit at the pool and you stare and daydream. <laughs> All day long. That's all you do. It was great. It was the best dang job after that. And I worked a lot less like physically in mental labor was a lot less for more pay. Extreme amount of pay compared to working at McDonald's. And I just sat there and daydreamed all day long because the swimming pool I was guarding was no bigger than a bathtub anyway. So that was great. And my mom was always right about the fact that the higher you are in administration, the less work you do. I worked at McDonald's. I daydreamed as a, as a lifeguard, but got paid a lot more. So, yeah. <laughs> I quickly learned. Oof, that was a lot of work. All right, lots of these hypertensive, kidney disease, diagnosing things going on. If I was doing the process of elimination, which I do do, I love it. Eyes all the way down, one's all the way down. Then my zero doesn't match. My two, three doesn't match with these twos. So I would get rid of these. The only difference between these is the third digit, right? And this nine, 
the one thing I do know about the diagnosis code areas is usually the nines, the ones that end in nine, are not elsewhere specified. They're NOSs, non-specific. Does AAPC usually pick those as answers? Nope. So I would know that D is my answer for this one. That's how I would do this exam question. But let's see what you guys think. The stage is also missing. Yep. So don't read these from the beginning. Don't. Always start at the bottom. And it just says the patient has hypertension, CKD, stage 5. And that's all you need to, to code. And they don't have... Um, on dialysis, if they had stage 5 on dialysis, that number would be a 6. Other than that, that's all I know about CKD. And if I was looking at this question, that's exactly how I would do it. Now to pick that D and moved on with my day without looking at any answers. Or even looking at the question is what I meant to say. Here it is. Here's one of them. This was on the CPC exam for March. For March. And the answers to this question are actually in your CPT book. Where is it at? somewhere <laughs> they're they're either on the back cover or they're on pay on the xx or xxi pages somewhere what this means and i think it's split up i remember seeing this the other day and was like oh there they are i knew they were in this book but they're somewhere Or they're on the back panel. You did that one already? Very good. C is your answer. So be sure if you don't have that definition written somewhere in your CPT book where you know you can find it. Because just in case, you might know it today with me. But under a high-pressured situation where you're super stressed, you might not be able to remember it. So just write it in the book. and Write it somewhere where you will know it. Another hypertension one. Get out my bigger thing so y'all can't be seeing these questions. Um, process of elimination, right? What would y'all toss and what would you keep? Do you see any coding irregularities? Yeah, we got a history of, right? Pretty important to look for, right? Do we, in general, do these, like, non-specific, just an I-10 or an I, you know, that just looks incomplete and unspecific. Just in general, I would get rid of A. That looks really terrible. Yeah, for sure. And because of that, I would get rid of D too because of the same issue down here. So now it's just a difference between adding your two, your point two, or if we have history of. And I see that smoke and cigarettes, so we know we're going to keep our our Z, right? You remember that one too on your exam. Did you, did you go get the right answers, you think, on these? 
is simply like with the process of elimination or did you look up all the codes and because that would be terrifying to go all the way down to the eight nine one and <clears throat> on the practice exams okay <clears throat> We're in the same hunting grounds for practice questions then, huh? huh? What'd she say, Annie? You need to get with Jen and spill the beans on the exam for her. What does she need to spill about it? MK, we need to do something about her educator, her um, boot camp teacher, man. <clears throat> and I heard, though, that some teachers were joining in on my live. So if there are any educators here, please reach out if you want to do a joint um, workshop or a joint live. I know your students and my students or mentees is what I call them because I do everything for free. I like to teach for free. Um, just we can do a joint one together and they would both benefit from that. Absolutely. Say what was on it. Uh, that she took the exam. <laughs> she keeps sending you emails for tutoring. Why? She told you you, you will never be a coder and we're going to prove her wrong. Yeah, sometimes, and that's perfectly fine. The The way I teach sometimes can probably absolutely be the wrong way for somebody else to learn. You never know. People need to learn in different ways. I do my best to, to exp and I go repetitively, to try to explain things differently, but the same thing in different ways, too, to, to help out. But it's hard, you know, we're, we're country, you know, cities away from each other and across the country i'm the only one talking here y'all are typing and i don't read very well and comprehend too so sometimes i have to be you know jennifer no it's this or you know comprehending what y'all are typing and then what i'm trying to say it's it's very difficult i'm surprised y'all can learn anything from me <laughs> but i'm trying i'm i really want to help so um some teachers some people just need a different way of learning, and that's fine. And I'm happy to collab and share my ideas and thoughts with all of them. And then, you know, y'all can take what, what I have and pair it up with what you've got and, and make it even better for everybody, for sure. Yeah, the CEU practice exams, don't do them until you pass your exam. Or at least make sure you leave one answer wrong. You can take them and have it graded and then just make sure you always, when you hit grade, make one answer wrong. Go on and write the answers down for all the practice exams for the, for the past 15 months. And then when you do pass... You can go right back in there and do the correct answers, and then you'll have 15 CEUs instantly right out of the bat, and then you won't have to do any for a year. So just don't complete them. Just make sure you get at least one answer wrong every time you do the free practice ones that are on the magazine thingy. That way you can save them. And don't do any ahead of time once you do get your license, your certification, um, if you if they told you to do 36, do 36 and stop. Don't do any extras because they won't roll over and they won't be saved and they just go away. It won't be count to anything. So just save them. Yeah, JP, he my link tree in my TikTok 
um, bio here. You just click on my face, me with the little boys up there. If you click on that, it'll bring you to my bio. And down there, there's a link tree link. And you can click on that. It has all my social media links, including the YouTube, Facebook. But it also has the link for the Discord room, which is amazing. Amazing. Correct, Marlo. She is 100% correct. Oh, it's time's up already? Oh, my gosh. All right. What's our differences here? We're actually having an annual wellness exam. They do have a high BMI. They did receive some counseling for risk factors for obesity. That was 10 minutes. What would we bill for this situation? Ten minutes is a low number. I would be surprised if they got any time for that, but it would barely make it, right? So just knowing that the time is so little that um, it would be one of the littler numbers for sure. Let's see what we got. We got our 01. Obesity. It doesn't necessarily meet the criteria for the 11 and 12 right there is what they're saying because it's just not a significant illness for the patient. So they did the risk adjustment ones in the in those beginning one codes right there. Yeah. They're group ones. Yeah. Anybody remember their Greek from language arts in high school? You might need to know some of those terms. JP was asking about anatomy. Aneurysm. MK remembers some of that Greek. I wonder if your educator knows her Greek. <laughs> Aneurysm. Narrowing. No, 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 no. What's happening in an aneurysm? That is happening in an aneurysm. You have an aorta going through your body, and we have this stuff going on. The walls in your aorta are weakening and becoming thinner and releasing. Yeah. And then they put stents in usually to repair those little rotty things so that you, they can give you fake walls. Yep, we got widening. To dilate is to take something that circumference and make it this circumference. But it doesn't mean the weakening of the walls and stuff. Yeah. Here's some of those fancy, fancy, fancy modifiers I was talking about today. You have to get out that hip picks book to find these because those are not going to be in your CPT book as far as I remember. I don't think so. Anybody know the differences between our KD, our KO, does not mean knockout, KP, and KX?
these are in your hit picks book a list of all modifiers are in there so if we have a patient who is having outpatient T cell services which modifier would you be using Hmm. Multi drugs, good. KD is DME, it is. Yep, yep. T cell therapy. We're going to have D on this one. So, you have to always double check with this one, but they love to deny it, of course. They're, I'm surprised even T cell therapy would ever be covered by anything anyway. You know, they're going to kick out anything that goes along with it. Probably not a particular question you might see on the CPC exam. Maybe one for COC. Mm. But it's good to know at least that you know where to find any of their strange, weird modifiers are. Don't forget to look in your hit picks book. They're all listed there. Just in case. Yep. Sherry's got it going on. We use KX. Patient has m maxed out their benefits for Medicare, and they're using multiple benefits. Mm -hmm. You will run out of Medicare benefits very quickly. They, you'd think that once you get Medicare, you're good. You're 65. You made it. But they only cover the... You know, you could only have like home health or something for 60 days for the rest of your life. You know how long you might need home health or something? I mean, that's all you get for living to 65 years old is just a few days of benefits for a lot of things. So it's it's pretty harsh what they don't cover. Absolutely. We got another one. Where am I at? Where's my uh, home? No, draw this right here. Oh, good. This I think this is the last question, guys. For 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 uh, Twinkle. By the way, see any coding irregularities or anything you would never code, or do they all look good? Do you see anything that shouldn't be first or should be second? Those kinds of things are helpful to notice. What would you, what would be out of sequence or order if you, you know, never had to do it? And it's probably... A good one to count how many diagnoses are in the last sentence. Then you'd know, am I getting rid of the top two or the bottom two? And then it's just a difference between which one goes first, right? Is it which one would go first? If if it's two diagnoses, 
which one do we know always goes first? Yep, we would we would do that one before we would do that one. But we just need to verify that we have two diagnoses in here. So I would start at the bottom, see what we're doing. Ooh, we got a STEMI question. The doctor documents a diagnosis of acute with a known history of STEMI involving the left coronary artery. Why is that up there? Oh, the Wi-Fi calling thing. You missed it three times. Oh, no. Oh, no. One or two diagnoses. In all that red that I underlined, would we only do one diagnosis? Oh, we're going to have two. So at least you can get yourself down to a 50-50, right? And then if you know the sequencing of normal hypertension-ish areas, what would be coded first numerically, it gets you down to the right answer. So looking at it a little differently sometimes helps. Here's your guidelines for this one. You know, our guideline is it's still acute for 28 days. And they're saying it was two weeks ago. So our guideline is 28 days until you call it an old MI. No longer in the um, acute phase. So it has to be 28 days before you can change it. It still will be acute for that whole 28 days. And since it happened within two weeks, it's about 14 to 15 days, we're still in the acute phase. Yep. And I have a one-sheeter note on this one, too, that's on our Discord which is so helpful. If y'all aren't in there, please be sure and get in our Discord. It is super helpful. Once you're in there, we have so much. Somebody was asking me today about their cameras, um, things they use on the day of the exam if they're taking it in person. And I know Betty and I both have posted pictures of exactly what camera to use what external camera to use. Um, all that stuff is in here. If you want to file for an ADA to get more time, um, if you want to apply to get your apprenticeship removed before you even take the exam, you can do so. I have all the steps here um, posted so that you know how to email them, where to email it, and what my even letter was sent and looked like. If you wanted to get your A removed before you take your exam, you can do that. It's all in there. That's just in what date, what to expect there. Your anatomy stuff is med terms. All that stuff is in all these rooms. Um, tons of practice questions. We're going to have screenshots of some of my notes and books. Those one sheeter pages that I tell you about, the sepsis and stuff, is all in here. They even do practice questions and stuff in all these different rooms. So you can take it subject by subject and uh, even see who all's passed. <laughs> We've got a mess of people that have been passing their exams too. So and follow along with the joys. We even have job postings, um, CEU help, 
um, today I was in there posting something. Oh, yeah, that lady. I love watching her because she's got a best friend who tells you the politically correct way to say, I've I've been too busy to get to your email. What do you say? You know, it's like, <laughs> what do you say if you don't want to hear from them again or that's not in my job description to do? <laughs> what do you say? So I like those. They're, they're pretty fun. Um, but yes, our Discord group is great. It's free. This is my Discord number if you're looking for us, um, the 6243. You can also go to the linkies here in Tiki Talks. So let's see if I go there. To me, you can go right there to that link tree that's right there in my bio. Click on that. And it's got everything on it. The Instagram, Pinhurst. I don't even know how to work those. So they're there, but I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> My medical notes, the uh, YouTube, the Discord right there um, to schedule tutoring or one-on-one -on -one book prep. You know, all that stuff is there. But the Discord group's right there. You just click on that and it'll take you right there to our Discord and just hit accept the invite. Yep, that's all. Super handy dandy. Hey moms, how's it going? Just finishing up here. Mm -hmm. Betty's going to be taking hers pretty soon, right? Yeah. It's okay. Get it wrong all you want. And it's it's better, you learn better by getting things wrong before, if, if I just get it right, then I forget the data anyway. I don't forget it when I get it wrong. I definitely get that to my memory banks afterwards. I do have some tutoring tomorrow. And after that, Sunday is Easter Sunday, so no workshop this Sunday. But next Sunday, we're going to have one. What does everybody want on their workshop? Is there anything y'all are just dying to see and wish I would do a workshop on? <sighs> no worries. Happy to see you join in, JP. Happy Easter, everybody. Yes, we got the Easter bunny coming. <laughs> Poor Annie. I wish I could sit with you guys. I wish there was a way I could be a little birdie in your ears. Like you wear some glasses and have a little earpiece in and then I can see your feed on your exam and I could see you bubbling in a an A when it's supposed to be B and I could go eh, 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 go look go, go go back go look at that again <laughs> are you or, or whispering your ear are you reading that entire question really <laughs> that would be awesome if I could just sneak in just a couple of times and just you know stop it don't read that question it's full of garbage go back to the answer Look for the process of elimination. Look for coding irregularities. Don't you see it? You see that? It's right there. Now, what would the answer be? Come on. Keep you focused. I would just love that. I wouldn't want to give you every single answer. You want to do it, some of it on your own, but I would love to just jump in every once in a while and, and help out and get you to that level and not let them trick you. They're just, they wrote these questions so psychologically awful that are there just to trick you, to force you into having to pay for another exam. I know they're for profit corporation, but they're doing something that is something that you need and have to have to get into the industry. So I'm 20 minutes over. What is one page on hypertension looking? Me too. I'm going to be stoked when you pass too. It's so expensive to take another test. 
If I read, then my brain goes, no, no, that's so good, MK, good. You keep me in your head. I did it the other night, Wednesday night. I started reading the whole question. We got all passionate about this question. But if we had stayed at the answers, done the process of elimination, went to the codes, looked only for the codes, we would have never even thought about what was going on in that question and we would have picked the right answer and moved on absolutely and I did a tutoring with that question um, Thursday morning and the the two Minty got them got it completely correct because she stayed focused and she went from the first CPT code to the second CPT code and just Kept it on exactly like she was supposed to. And she was the only one to get it right. It took us like three times to figure out what the heck we were doing. You got to stop reading the questions. What was the one page on hypertension? My one page on hypertension, I don't think I... Do I have one on hypertension? I got... Um, the one pager I have is on a heart attacks. The myocardial infarctions, that's my one pager that I have on that one. I have one on um, cancer. I have one on sepsis. I have one on uh, acute and chronic conditions when you code those two together. So those are all those little one-sheeters. They're going to be under your uh, either CPT book prep or your ICD-10 book prep. But they're all in there and if I need to repost them I will so they pop up easier and oh they're on my website too so let's see if we go to we go to where are we at we go to medical coding oh gosh dog Medical coding by Jen. Oh, why can't I go to the website? Oh my gosh. I'm at the Google address. We go to my CPT book prep area. I got to log on. Log on. I don't want to log on. There we go. We'll log on. We go to CPT book prep. Go to that dashboard, and each one of these pictures has a description of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and why you should do it. Anyway, if you click on those, but you keep going, keep going. Here's my one-sheeters. So this is my one on sepsis. This is the one on E&M. This is the one on, oh, that's, that's the critical care or urgent care. No, what is this one? This is the one on E&M. This is the, the one sheeter on prolonged services. So it takes outpatient prolonged services, non-face-to-face -face visits, and hospitalization prolonged services. Puts it all onto one chart. So if you're 30 to 40 minutes for prolonged services, if you're in the hospital, it's that answer. If you're in... Um, outpatient services, it's that answer if it's between those minutes. So that's what that one page does. And then, where am I at? I gotta go back. Oh my gosh. Where am I at? CPT book prep. And we scoochie, scoochie, scoochie down. And then that's the heart attack one. That's the heart attack one. This one is the sequel. And I've got one for HIPAA too. But those one sheeters are all right there, free for anybody to use if y'all want them. And then what to do with your diagnosis code book and how to fix your guidelines, move those to the codes. That is super helpful. And then how I write examples in the ICD 10 book when there's multiple diagnosis codes listed for one example, what I do for the extra diagnosis codes. So, got lots of info there that's super helpful along the lines. <sighs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four,
why would you not read the test question? Because the test question is written so psychologically to confuse you. They are trying to direct your attention away from the CPT codes and to pick codes that are not the proper answer. And if you avoid the questions and just go to the CPT codes, you will find out that a lot of the codes, you only need a patient's age. Are they younger than five, older than five? Then you just look at the question just for the patient's age. Well, they're over 10, so you know the only answer it could be is the CPT code assigned to a patient that's over 10. Many questions are like that. Some questions are with or without guidance is the only difference between the codes. Then you only need to search the question for whether they used an ultrasound or fluoroscope. If they didn't use it, then you're not going to use the code with fluoroscope or, or um, an ultrasound. It makes the exams questions and your time pacing a lot better. You only have two minutes and I don't know, 20 seconds per question to get the answer right. If you sit there and read these huge, long op notes and go look up every CPT code, you are going to not be able to pat finish your exam. And you'll have to guess the last answers. With my process of elimination, with looking for coding irregularities, before you start looking at a question, that is going to save you a ton of time. You are going to look up the codes that are remaining after you've done the process of elimination and look for coding irregularities. Then you're going to look at the CPT code descriptors for those two codes. Find what will make the difference. Is it with radiology, without? Am I distal or proximal? Am I an open procedure versus a closed procedure? And only look at your ans your question for that info. Pick that info out. It's an open procedure. They used a scalpel. Yay, here we go. We got the right answer and move on to the next question. It's the only way that I know of, of how to pass the exam. Get the right answers, the most efficiently, time-consuming wise, and to be sure that you pick the right answer. Go try that exam without doing it and try to read every word and look up every code and see how far you get in four hours. It's going to be rough. You will have to guess about 30 of those questions by just bubbling them in. And that's how many you can miss is only 30. So they just have it structured that way. You have to do... 25 questions an hour now, right? Is that is that right, guys? Um, and that that is challenging. Even the most hardened coders would code, what, 10 charts an hour? If you're zooming through some urgent cares or hospitalizations, I don't know how you do it, but it's you got to do twice as many that I've ever seen done in an hour. Oh, yeah, the diabetes one. Mm hmm. I do have a few. Let's see. That are so good. Let's see. No, the shop. We go to shop. I have that one that you're talking about, the diabetes one. It's got all my notes about all the diabetes and guidelines that go along with it. That one's just like six bucks or something, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That one's a good one. I go through all the pregnancies. If you get gestational diabetes versus if you already had type 2 diabetes or already had type 1, but you're pregnant, how do you code it? What sequencing? How do you code the oral medication versus the insulin medication versus getting your pancreas taken out, having it removed? What guidelines do you use there? How do you code that separately or differently or what sequencing orders and all that stuff? So that's where the diabetes ones is. Medical coding by Jen.com. 
link tree is in the bio. You don't receive Etsy notes. You go to your Etsy account, go look at your pur purchases history, and you download them because they're in your account. No one mails instant downloads. Those are downloadable documents that you will just go to your and you and if you used a fake email address on Etsy, that's one issue because they'll e email you the link to download them. I find a lot of people do that, but that's fine. All you got to do is go into your Etsy account, click on your bubble, which is your face or name or icon, go into your account history, look at your purchases, and that's where your downloads are at. You can download them anywhere in the world you want on any device you want. It is easier to look at on a desktop version of Etsy than it is to see it on a phone, but they're there. They're in your Etsy account. Thank you for the love. Thank you for the roses. So if you're here, you're on TikTok. So you're, you're halfway there to everything that I have. So all you got to do is click on my bubble, which is that face right up there with all the hair and the boys. You'll get to this page, and then you just click on that link tree. That link tree will give you access to everything. All of it's there. YouTube, Discord, all that stuff. Just be sure you download the Discord app beforehand. You set up your own account. Once that's all set up, reboot your phone. Come back to TikTok. Talk, click on my bubble, click on the link tree, and then click on that. Or you can just go to medicalcodingbygen.com and all the links are there too because that's where we're at right now. And you can just go to, whoops, where am I at? I can't see my screen anymore. No okay. We can go to just the social media links. They're all right there. They're all there. And there's our Discord. You can hit join now. And there's me. Helping you guys out. There's my schedule when I'm supposed to be live here on Tiki Talk. I'm trying to do the 4.30. Today was 5. It's just a rough time. Because the kids get home at 4.10. I stop working at 4. And uh, it's hard to go live for two hours and not have the kids around and interrupting and all that stuff. It was better when it was 6.30 because then I'd have a couple of hours to get them settled down, fed, and then I'd go disappear. And they love that because then they'd have their own time away from me. But usually right when I get, they get home and from school, they like to hang out with me and tell me about their day and all that stuff. But I'm trying. Anyway, guys. What, did I, what gift did I get Travis from all... What gift? Oh, my gosh. Well, he's suspended from school for right now, so I hired a lawyer. <laughs> you see all of his IEPs I got downloaded right here. So I'm going to sue the school district, and so he's getting a gift of a lawyer right now. <laughs> Poor kid. It's like, dang it, y'all need to stop picking on him, sending him home. He ain't getting any education sitting here, and he didn't do anything worth suspended him for. All right. <laughs> Poor Betty. <laughs> How do you get to the spot that I'm at on the website? We've got all these drop down menus. All you got to do is hover over them. They pop up and then you go to whatever page you want. If you want to see the members only pages, you do have to sign up for an account, but I don't track you or send you a ton of crap. The social media link tab is free for everybody. You just need to go to my website and click on it. You'll get to see all of this, where I'm at and where YouTube and all that stuff is at. The Discord link is there. Um, if you want the CPT book prep room and my book prep videos, or blog, those are the only things you sign up for, but it's all free. I do have a shop, and that's how you book if you want one-on-one -on -one tutoring or if you want to book a workshop. 
I'm going to have a workshop. I don't have one right now going on, but I will have one on Sunday the 24th. I'm going to go fill that out pretty soon. I just need to know what y'all want to do on the workshop. We've, did, we've done E&M, cardiology, and integnitary. What should we do on our next one? I know y'all are wanting musculoskeletal. I did lab and path and cardiology and E&M on my last one that was free this month because it was my birthday month. But we need to do another one on the 24th. What should we do? And this is what Discord looks like if you pull it up on your desktop. You can do that too. You can see all the rooms, do all the book prep. Ask Betty a million questions, bless her heart, or Twinkle. She's in there too. Y'all can bug her. Janet's in there. She does the CCS and CCAs. But yeah, we got all those rooms in there. What do y'all want? I know, I'm way over Twinkle. Anesthesia, that's a good area. Yeah, muscular skeletal, more ears and eyes. Neuro, E&M. Oh my gosh. Neuro, anesthesia. You know I'm going to do E&M. Female and male genitalia. Circumcisions and delivering babies is a good area too. I'm so indecisive. I can't make up my decisions. I can't make decisions. Okay, guys, I'm going to get off here and go hang out with my mom and the boys for a minute before I shoo them off to bed. I hope this has been helpful, guys. I will see y'all. Where are we at? Not till Monday night. Another live. Monday night will be another live. Yeah, definitely do an E&M for sure on that workshop. And um, y'all have a very good Easter. I do have tutoring tomorrow, but it's just in the morning. So if y'all need me, I'll be around. And I will see y'all again for another live on Monday night. Good night, guys. I hope it was helpful. Thanks, Betty. I really appreciate you, Twinkle, MK, Mean. All of y'all, y'all are so good. JP, nice to meet you. Marlo, happy Easter. Thanks, guys.